Jonathan Balcom was born in England, raised in New Zealand and Canada, and has lived in the United States since 1987. He has three biology degrees, including a PhD in ethology, the study of animal behavior, from the University of Tennessee, where he studied communication in bats. He has published over 50 scientific papers on animal behavior and animal protection. Formerly, formerly department chair for animal studies with the Humane so Society University and senior research scientist with the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, Jonathan is currently director of animal sentience with the Humane Society Institute for Science and Policy in Washington, D.C. Balcom has written several books, including Second Nature, Pleasurable Kingdom, and his latest title, the New York Times best-selling What a Fish Knows. And he's actually going to be taught, doing a talk entitled What a Fish Knows tomorrow in the pair room at 3.30 p.m. So you can also catch that, or if you have friends who missed out today, they can catch him there. So without further ado, I'm going to give you Jonathan Balcom. Thank you for the introduction. Everybody can hear me okay? Great. And thanks to Northwest Veg for inviting me back. I, I've spoken at this event at least twice before, but never at this venue. And I think they've had it at this venue for several years. So to their discredit, they haven't invited me in several years, and I'm delighted they invited me this year. But what a great venue for this. And it says a lot about the growth of this movement, uh, interest in vegetarianism and veganism. Uh, I've never eaten as many good samples, uh, free samples. Uh, I almost didn't need my free lunch ticket. I, it's just because I'm a hungry vegan all the time that I used it anyway. The roots of our relationship to animals go back at least 23 centuries to uh, our modern relationship to animals go back at least 23 centuries to the time of Aristotle, who came up with this pyramid scheme, the scala naturae, or the natural scale that placed humans above all the other animals on earth, although below God and the angels. Twenty centuries later, René Descartes did nothing to raise the status of animals when he argued that they were, meaning non-human animals, were thoughtless automatons, mindless, soulless creatures, and therefore uh, they had no feelings, and therefore they were of no moral consequence. To this day, these ideas are influential, with animals pretty much universally around the world being classified legally as the property of humans. These ideas are still influential in the fact that we still kill, we kill 60 odd million terrestrial vertebrates a year, and an unknown number, but as possibly as over two trillion fishes, according to some estimates. We kill most of them to eat them, hence the relevance of, a, of a, an event like this. But we also kill hundreds of millions for things like fashion, to satisfy our scientific curiosity, for sport and recreation, and we might kind of characterize this type of relationship with other animals as a might-makes-right relationship, a way of thinking that has a pretty rich history in human behavior, including the colonialism era, the African slave trade, the subjugation of women's rights, and the denial of civil rights. We've relegated those particular social ills, ish, Ills largely to the history books and um, Steven Pinker, a psychologist at Harvard University, in his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined, comes up with a number of possible explanations for that. He calls them civilizing principles, oh, sorry, civilizing processes. I'll just go through a few of them here that I think are significant and relevant here. The rise of statehoods, that is to say, elected officials. Anyone who's been watching the debates may have mixed feelings about the uh, electoral process. Nevertheless, I think it's a, it's a step forward on, say, monarchies and uh, oligarchies and those sorts of situations that, we've, that were his typical in the past. Uh, the rise of uh, empowerment of women, feminization, I think is a very great powerful force to the good. It has been shown empirically, scientifically, that women tend to be the more nurturing gender. That's often borne out by the demographics of, of events like this. International commerce, where other countries, instead of being a source of human labor through slavery, today, in the current era, would be more, viewed, more likely to be viewed as valuable trade partners. The rise of literacy, an incredible rise, tens and tens of percentages in the last century. Um, the rise of literacy from just in, in, teen, in the teens to the low 20s a century ago, up to the 70s to 80 percent literacy rates around the world today. That's an incredible change in just one century. The rise of cosmopolitanism, where we're more of a global community with, with a very quick communication, thanks to the Internet, for instance. And finally, the rise of reason. This is a bizarre thing, some data that Pinker 
described in his book, but um, average uh, IQ scores have gone up about 3% per decade in the last century. And this is not knowledge-based. This is raw uh, IQ. Why that is, I'm not sure, but it's, a, it's an interesting change. Uh, in any event, it may feed into the fact that we are possibly more reasonable than we were historically and maybe more moral. And I just want to add that along with these important social changes, we're seeing an unprecedented rise, particularly in the very current era we're living in, in a rise in interest and concern for other species. And that's where I'm going to be focused today. Why is this happening now? Well, perhaps uh, we've just, our reason has risen to the point that we, we have philosophers like Peter Singer, whose uh, 1975 book, Animal Liberation, is considered by many to, the, to be the manifesto of the modern animal rights movement. And then the ideas of Tom Reagan, these two philosophers are still living, uh, an American philosopher um, who is a deontologist, the idea of rights philosophy and animals having interests, very influential. And then we have biologists who've, who've been part of this change as well. Charles Darwin, uh, unquestionably the, the most important bio biologist of all time. Uh, the idea of, of evolution by natural selection, a sort of an idea, or which is now kind of considered scientific fact among most scientists, a law of nature that unites humans with other species, literally in flesh and blood with common ancestry. Very influential in, I think, bringing us to where we are now, where we're really reflecting seriously on the moral implications of our relationships to animals. More recently, Donald Griffin, an American biologist, who in the 1970s began thinking about what do animals think and how do they feel. And he wrote several books that, that really ushered in an era, which makes it very exciting now to be an ethologist, my field, an era where we're thinking and scientists are asking questions that were considered taboo for much of the 20th century, questions about how animals think and how they may feel. Then, of course, there are biologists who don't really need any introduction, such as their fame. So as I said, it's a very exciting time to be an ethologist. So in the remainder of my three and a half hour lecture, I just wanted to share some highlights with you about our relationship with animals and what we're discovering now about them. Things like metacognition in rats. This is a, a studies that show that rats not only can think, but they're aware of what they know and what they don't know. They know when they're confident in an answer and they can tell you when they're not confident in an answer. And really, Part of the challenge of the science of, of cognitive ethology in this case is coming up with clever experimental designs that allow you to ask questions like that and to probe into the mind of an animal who's not just ready and willing to tell you what they're thinking or how, they're think, how they think. Tool use in fishes, fishes who will use water as a tool to uncover a mo mollusk and then carry that mollusk to a particular rock and use that rock as an anvil to open the mollusk with a series of well-timed head flicks and releases as this tusk fish here is doing. Tool use in reptiles, a group of animals, cold-blooded, uh, uh, you know, reptiles just instinct-driven. It's just not true. You can read a wonderful book by a colleague of mine called Ra Dragon Songs in which he toured the world studying 26, the t all 26 species of crocodilians and discovered things like tree climbing, orgies, cooperative hunting, and tool use. In this case, uh, it's been known from, uh, it's now described in two populations of different crocodiles around the world. Uh, in which they carry sticks, float them on their heads, and then they go to heron rookeries, and then they submerge themselves and allow the sticks to float just over their heads. Herons build their nests out of sticks, do the math. There's a real premium on sticks. Herons fly down to grab those sticks, and that may be the last thing they do that day. So it's a very clever bit of tool use that requires particular timing and particular location because herons do not just nest anywhere and they don't nest year-round. You need to pick the right time to do this and they don't bother doing this when herons aren't nesting. That shows a level of awareness and uh, wherewithal in a group of animals that we've really dismissed as pretty simple-minded uh, that we, we wouldn't have believed existed until somebody looked closely at this. Advances in technology are allowing us to explore aspects of animals' lives that we couldn't really probe before. Camera traps allow us to see things like this, a small kind of African cat. These are genets. These are photos taken by cameras that are tied up to trees or left somewhere in an area where animals walk at night, and the camera does the rest of the work. It takes pictures when it's triggered by motion. And uh, so you can discover things like hitchhiking, essentially using large mammals, in this case, uh, a, a, I think a white rhino, 
and an African buffalo as a taxi service to get from A to B. Convenient, you're up high, you have a better view of the surroundings, you can jump off easily or jump back on, they probably don't mind too much. It's a pretty insignificant amount of weight, and it's probably safer. The only drawback is you kind of have to go where the animals are going. But our big plus probably is that little um, tree shrews, or not tree shrews, but uh, little shrews and other small mammals, uh, which might be part of the diet of a genet, are often going to be running away to not be stepped on by these creatures. So you also have a sort of a, an animal who's stirring up the action and uh, give you a better opportunity to find food. And then discoveries like naming in dolphins. We know dolphins are big brain and smart but they actually have labels for each other. They don't literally call each other Nancy and Kyle, but they do have what we call signature whistles, uh, sounds that they make that are distinctive to individuals, and they can say their own whistle, and they can say the whistle of somebody else. So they're referring to someone else perhaps to get their attention. And in concert with these changes and these discoveries, um, publications in scientific literature is, is taking an, an interest in questions that it really wasn't asking before. I've written a couple of books about animal pleasure, and I'm going to spend some time talking about animal pleasure in this talk because so often we talk about pain and suffering. Very important not to be neglected subjects, but I think it's very important to talk about the other side of the coin of experience, and that is the, the joys of life, the ways that we can enjoy life. And to, to wit, this uh, Current Biology, a, a great journal, publishes a lot of interesting research that I keep an eye on. I had an issue on the biology of fun with a, a couple of dozen papers just a couple of years ago focused on animals' capacity to feel good. That was really neglected, which stirred me to write my book, Pleasurable Kingdom, which came out 10 years ago, was that this was a really a ne neglected subject. And now uh, scientists are showing much more interest in this area. I also want to just put out a word for one of the newest journals on the blocks. I happen to be one of the founding editors of this journal. It's called Animal Sentience. It's the first journal of animal feeling. We are completely open access, no subscription fees, available online, and we publish um, because we're an online journal. We don't have to wait until we have enough articles to fill a print edition. We publish papers as they're readied. Not always papers we agree in, agree with, such as the first target article we had, Why Fish Do Not Feel Pain, we don't agree with that position. But one of the great things we do is that we invite commentaries and responses. And we've had about 50 responses to that particular one, most of which are, were scientific rebuttals. So, but it's very, very important that we have scientific discourse and discussion of these important, timely questions. Otherwise, they're just sort of swept under the rug and we don't have any moral progress. And, and knowledge fuels change. And so it's important that we have these discussions. All right, hands up to anyone who hey, does or has done lived with cats or dogs in, in the past or the present. Yes, you'd think this was an animal-loving crowd with that response. Um, yes, uh, and my hand could go up too, I have as well. Uh, just a little story about animal emotions. If you live with cats, you know they're, they're pretty aversive to change. They don't like changes. Um, they don't, certainly don't love going to the vet, following a visit to the vet. Um, this cat, Micah, uh, went on a 40-hour on a hunger strike. He hid out under the bed upstairs. He wasn't even the one who'd been to the vet. <laughs> it was his sister here, Megan, uh, who came home with that foul chemical smell of a, of a vet, and cats just do not like that smell. And uh, she was more freaked out later when he went to the vet. Uh, it's interesting. It's sort of the, the sense of knowing that there was a vetness, a vet presence that seems to freak out cats more than actually going to the vet. But uh, that's an anecdote, of course. Anecdotes are very important. They, uh, they are often the, the origin of ideas for scientific studies. But uh, I visited the Clever Dog Lab at uh, Vienna University in Austria a couple of years ago and saw an apparatus like this where you have willing people's pets, companion animals who are willing participants. They can say they've had enough any time. This is not what I would call vivisection. These animals are willing participants. It's non-invasive research. And a dog can be trained to stick his head in a little cradle um, so that the head is still, and then you can have a camera mounted so that it tracks, it tracks eye movements, and you can see how the dog's eyes change and move in response to different uh, visual stimuli presented to the, to the dog. And then, of course, you give the dogs treats. That's how you train them to be good and keep their he head in that uh, little cushion. And you can test them with things like different faces and how they respond, how their eyes react, do their pupils dilate, uh, do they show more or less interest? Do their heart rates increase? Does their blood pressure change? I mean, all these measures we can do to probe, into again, into the mind and heart of an animal who's not just going to say, I feel like this. Um, they could be lying if they said that, but physiological measure, measures don't tend to lie. And you find that when they look at a negative face of a human or a dog, 
they have reactions, but they do not glance to the left when they look at a dog face, be it uh, n aggressive, neutral, or happy. Uh, they do glance to the left, whatever face they're looking at, if it's a human, uh, because our faces actually are bilater bilaterally conveying different information about how we feel. The left side of our face tends to convey more information due to the nature of our brain signaling. And so through time, through evolutionary time, during the 15,000 or so years that dogs have been manipulating us, they've learned to... They've learned to recognize our faces and to respond to them in that sort of a way. So they glance left. Lo and behold, so do we. We glance left when we look at a human face. Are you aware of it? Probably not. But it's a, it's a useful thing. You're getting more information about the emotions and feelings of that individual right then and there. That's very useful to get a quick read because you want to maybe respond in a way that maybe won't antagonize them. Like the guy I tried to give a vegan T-shirt day shirt uh, um, um, card to uh, half an hour ago, he didn't seem to be into that. I read the left side of his face subconsciously. They also present a controlled stimulus, a shoe, which has no bilateral meaning whatsoever. And sure enough, they don't glance left when they look at a shoe. And then you can mount a camera over the dog and see which way the tag whale, the tag whales, the whale, the, the tail wags. Ooh, how's that for a little brain uh, gymnastics for you? Lo and behold, it turns out that a dog who is a little bit apprehensive, such as in a situation like this perhaps, now the tail's up there, the tails are up, that shows confidence, but if these dogs are a little apprehensive, their tail gonna wa tail's going to wag a little more to the left or from where you're sitting more this way. It's going to be sort of that way. If they're neutral, it's kind of uh, equal, but if they're kind of happy and confident, the tail's wagging a little bit more to the right. You wouldn't know these things unless you trained dogs to sit there while well, you could discover it other ways, but... It's nice to measure things. Science, scientists like to measure things. And then there's scientists like uh, this guy, uh, who is, whose name escapes me right now, Greg Byrne. That's it. He's putting do training dogs to sit still in fMRI machines. These are brain scanning machines that can uh, scan live activity. We can be told to sit still, and we can do it pretty well. They don't know that, so you train them through rewards and treats uh, and then put headphones on them so they can't hear the nasty sounds of these machines. And they can s stay still for 25, 30 seconds, long enough to get a really interesting reading on how they respond to, for instance, uh, underarm swabs from humans they know and humans they don't know, or anal swabs from dogs they know and they don't know. And you can see, uh, you know, now you're glad you're not in these studies. But um, and you can, and again, these are people's companion animals, and they're happily, happily engaged. Dogs are very, very focused on us, as you probably know that. They love to please us. They love to be in, involved in this stuff. But at the minute they want to quit, they can do that, and that's part of the study design. So um, it's nice to see that scientists are being more, some scientists are being more animal friendly in their techniques. Scientists have done studies showing that when kept for uh, a, a few days in a very small, uh, unstimulating, enclosure, a small cage where they can't fly, they don't get any interesting food, they don't have social company, uh, starlings will become pessimistic in their view of things. They will be less likely to try something with an uncertain outcome than will starlings who've been kept in a, in a flight cage with, s with social stimulation and a lot of interest in their lives. So animals not only have fleeting emotions, I think it's very telling and poignant, not just how they're feeling at that moment, but sort of moods, how they're, how they're feeling in general an ambient emotional state, and pessimism and optimism are ambient emotional states. Uh, that says something about the inner lives of a bird that I, we were not appreciating back in Descartes' time, the, never mind Aristotle's. And there's a similar study design is being used to show that goats who had a history, or suggest that goats who had a history of abuse um, are more pessimistic after living at a sanctuary for a few years. There's several new sanctuaries who are, um, have tables out here, if you haven't been to those. And by the way, I've, I've volunteered on a sanctuary for many years, and goats are really fun to interact with. They're really interesting. They're definitely pleasure seekers, like humans are. And particularly females seem to have a, a more, it was a small sample size in this study, but female goats with a history of abuse seem to be more happy than, than the other goats, regardless of their history. Um, when they're in a sanctuary for at least two years. All right, on to the subject of pleasure. I mentioned, I mentioned I've written a couple of books about pleasure. pleasure. These are them. Just a little bit of background on pleasure. Way to, one way to put it, sort of in an evolutionary sense, is that, is that pain is nature's way of punishing maladaptive behaviors, behaviors that risk 
removing yourself from the gene pool through death or injury, uh, in potentially injurious behaviors. So pain teaches us to maybe don't do that behavior because it's not going to be good for your survival. Uh, the flip side is pleasure rewards adaptive behaviors, behaviors that promote survival, food, for instance, comfort, getting away out of the cold if it's if it's cold and getting warm, and um, and also sexual pleasure is a way to promote reproduction, which is not not critical to survival, but for genetic survival and reproduction, procreation, uh, selfish gene type stuff, it's it's absolutely indispensable. And animals show the behavioral hallmarks of feeling pleasure when they are given food if they're hungry. They, they're highly motivated to get food. If you don't eat food, you die. So not surprising, uh, nature endows us with a, with a great deal of desire to eat food. And fruit and plants have uh, exploited that desire for many, many, many generations. Fruit is very expensive for plants to produce. Why are they spending all that energy to produce this sweet, nice-smelling, brightly colored, very tasty, and very nutritionally packed uh, product, what we call fruit, well, it's to get those seeds moved around. Uh, plants can't move their seeds by themselves because they're sessile organisms. They're in one place, right? Some plants use the wind to blow their seeds around. Some plants uh, have, have de evolved seeds that stick to animals' fur or our clothes that we pluck off later and drop down somewhere else. Perfect. That's, that's exactly what the plant wanted us to do. We've moved the seeds somewhere else. And then fruit is another very successful strategy for moving seeds away from the parent plant where they don't have to compete for water and light and nutrients in the soil. And so papaya, papaya trees and, and blackberry plants and such do that. They use fruit as a vehicle to use a mobile organism, uh, a fruit-loving, pleasure-seeking animal to get those seeds somewhere else. I wonder who took that photograph. Is somebody in the audience who I think that, no, you didn't take that photograph? Oh, well, anyway, Beth Redwood up here has really helped me with a lot of my presentations, and she's taken her from very nice pictures of wild raccoons feeding on fruit in her yard. So that's a stand-in. This one wasn't taken by Beth. It was taken by me, a biologist who takes close-up pictures of animal feces to illustrate that uh, animals, it works by animals eating the seeds, moving somewhere else, crapping them out somewhere else in a convenient package of fertilizer where they're more likely to grow. We usually recognize play when we see animals playing. Uh, we think of play as sort of a frivolous thing. It's actually not frivolous. It's really very useful and adaptive. Play evolved probably to develop physical strength, to learn the ropes of social behavior, to important survival behaviors, fleeing an enemy or catching prey, hence chasing play is a very common play behavior. Uh, re wrestling and ruffle tum rough and tumble play, very commonly found in both predator and prey animals because it's very important for survival. Are the animals thinking of survival when they play? I would suspect not. They're probably simply enjoying the behavior in the present. It's a very proximate emotional experience. And we find it manifested in different species in various ways. This dog is not looking at the filthy tennis ball that he is about to chase. He's looking at the one who's going to throw it. And like all optimistic dogs, he's often running before the ball gets there. <laughs> Brings it back for another round. Uh, he's a lot younger than her, so she would get tired before he would, even though he was doing most of the work. But animals love to play, and we love to play. It's rewarding. It feels great, and it is adaptive. We are sort of, in a way, being manipulated by our genes when we play. But hey, it feels great. We're winners. We're winning in that game. Scientists did something that I'm, I'm proud to say I actually suggested in my book, Pleasurable Kingdom. I said, Would, wouldn't it be nice if instead of putting rat traps out, we put running wheels outside, outside and see if animals in wild animals would use them? Well, perhaps by coincidence, I can't take credit for it, but a, a research team from the Netherlands about three years ago published a paper in which they did just that. They put running wheels in little cages that small animals could move into, into and out of at will, into the wild and put night vision cameras on them and documented uh, these. You can't see it here. This actually, I don't think this is a video, no. There is, a, I have a video file of this, and you can find it online. They found that um, mice, my, wild mice would come in and run these wheels. There's actually one running it in here. That's why this is blurry. This wheel is in motion, sometimes for 30 seconds to a minute. In fact, maybe several minutes. I forget the exact numbers, but dozens or hundreds of mice used these wheels and explored them briefly. Uh, it's sort of a waste of energy, but they're curious, and that's part of a good survival skill is to be curious and try things, even though there may be some danger when we're being curious. Frogs also got in there, toads, even a slug, a very slow-moving wheel. <laughs> but a slug, I think, did about a quarter revolution in there, and then probably got tired and bored and got off there. So maybe even slugs like to play. 
I don't actually know how the slug got up under that wheel, but a slug was recorded. You can actually watch videotape of the slug moving very slowly. I think it's important to talk about touch as a very physical way of conveying and communicating, but also a very uh, important source of pleasure. We know touch is very, can be pleasurable for us, hence we go to massage therapists. Um, and we can use touch as a way to communicate with our loved ones and say that we accept them. And, and it feels nice, and it's um, a very physical way of sharing affection. And if you petted cats, you know they love to be scratched under the chin or on their head and certain spots that they like and don't like so much. And sheep also, and the sheep will tell you when they want more, if they're trusting and they're, they, they, they don't mind being around you. These are the couple of sheep that I was uh, petting with my, with my daughter. We were warming our hands. It was actually quite a cold day, and our hands were cold. So digging their hands into the backs of these sanctuary, these, these sheep, happy sheep on a sanctuary in Maryland where, where I was living at the time in near Washington, D.C., and I stopped to gesture about something, and I suddenly felt scraping on my boot. And I looked down, and Hickory was uh, pawing me uh, to continue. Well, that was how I read it. I'm pretty sure that's what she meant. And it's happened since uh, when you when you give them a nice back rub. They, they tell you they like it, and they can convey to you that they want more. They know you are an autonomous being who can make a decision to do more of what you were just doing. Some animals, like goats, have built-in back scratchers, so... They can relieve themselves, but they also love to be rubbed and scratched, and they would often walk up to me and just lean against me gently and stop. It's essentially an invitation for a back rub or a neck rub or whatever. And other wild animals do this. They exchange touch. They use touch to convey acceptance, social acceptance, to be to remind somebody they're part of the group. Um, to uh, and, and these individuals know each other. These three little finches, they look the same to us, but they're all individuals and they all have unique characteristics. They probably recognize each other by voice, possibly even by smell. Birds can smell, uh, but also by vision. Birds are very visual. And this one receiving this preening, this is so-called allopreening, preening another. These preening from these other two will remember those did that favor. And there's much more science, studies of vampire bats, for instance. I don't know if it's been studied in these particular birds show that individuals who've received a good deed from another, such as a massage, are more likely to do that to them in future. Not necessarily just a massage. It could be providing food. In, in the case of the vampire bat study, it was actually a blood meal that was exchanged by, among individuals. It was the first empirical demonstration of a theory called reciprocal altruism, the idea that individuals genetically related or not, this is not kin selection, will return a favor later for the simple reason that somebody gave them a favor earlier. And animals like macaw, macaws will uh, engage in these allopreening uh, uh, interactions. Here's a bizarre manifestation of the same phenomenon, uh, a predator-prey interaction, but there's no predator, predator preying on the prey. This is a warthog who's wandered in and flopped down in an invitation gesture where, near where he or she knows that there's a colony of banded mongooses. The mongooses come scurrying out and swarm all over the delighted uh, warthog who's receiving a spa treatment, a parasite removal service in exchange for a little tidbits of food and, and tidbits for the, uh, for the mongooses. So everybody benefits. It's a plus-plus symbiotic relationship. Another example, hippos and fishes. Uh, there's a nice article in National Geographic magazine some years ago showing th this photo, among others, and I knew I wanted to get it for one of my books. And these hippos forage on land at night, and then they wander into the water. These are springs in Kenya where this was studied. And they, um, the photographers built an underwater cage to take these remarkable photos. And the hippos then um, get in the water, and then they, they, they wait for the fishes to arrive, various species. The fishes know they're there. They come swimming over, and they pluck uh, vegetation from their teeth, uh, bits of plaque and what have you, uh, parasites from their skin, the hippos spread their legs and splay their toes to allow full access to these fishes that give them this cleaning spa treatment service in exchange for uh, food. And then we have another example here, the feral dogs. Great, thank you. Uh, feral dogs in parts of uh, North India have for probably centuries, if not millennia, been uh, hanging out with uh, wild langur monkeys. And the la langur monkeys groom the dogs, so the dogs also get a parasite removal service. Monkeys love to groom anyway, but they probably also nibble up some of these things that they remove as a bit of nutrition. But there's probably other ways that this is beneficial. The dog is a predator with sharp teeth and might warn away another troop of monkeys, a neighboring troop of monkeys, or some other threat. 
And um, also there's uh, cooperative vigilance here where the extra pair of set of eyes and noses, ears might warn of danger a little bit sooner than if the, the two parties were not there cooperate, cooperating. And we can experience this ourselves with, uh, you know, when we pet animals. I met, I met this um, tame warthog. Uh, I just want to point out the, the tame animal is on the right and the wild one is on the left. And uh, touch is a great way to communicate acceptance and, uh, through pleasure. Now I want to talk a little bit about fishes. I'm going to talk in more detail about them tomorrow, but I want to just give a few examples now to sort of whet your appetites, so to speak. And um, I've, I've spent about four years delving into the scientific literature about these misunderstood creatures who have so much more going on in their lives than we've been giving them credit for. And one example of this, back to the subject of touch, is cleaner client relations, cleaning stations on reefs and some other habitats. Fishes like these... Uh, blue-striped cleaner wrasses make a living. There's a pair of them actually working here. You can see one right at the top. Make a living by servicing clients, clients, so-called client fishes is what we call them. This is a map puffer fish who will have waited in line in a queue on a reef and then swum up to this cleaning station where these two cleaners then pluck over, removing algae, parasites. It's very similar to what we saw earlier with the warthog and the, and the, and the hippo with their cleaner cleaners giving them services. So once again, it's a mutualism. These guys get food. They make a living from this. They may service hundreds, even over a thousand clients a day. And these guys get a spa treatment, and they'll come back sometimes dozens of times a day to the same to the same station, almost um, greedy for, for more of this treatment. I don't think it's all parasite removal. I think they're also coming because they like it. In support of that notion, uh, client cleaners will take breaks from cleaning and then just just swim and, and, f and flutter their pectoral fins over the skin of these clients, giving them an extra caress, probably currying favor, essentially saying, hey, you know, come, come to me, us again. We'll give you a really good treatment. That's not insignificant because it's a competitive world out there. This is a living for these fishes. And clients can go to other cleaners, so clients, cleaners want to welcome clients back. That's probably why cleaners... Uh, don't do as good a job. They tend to be a bit more shoddy if there aren't many clients watching them. That's called an audience effect. And clients, for their part, are watching these interactions. And if it's shoddy treatment from the cleaners, they're more likely to go elsewhere. Uh, it gets more Machiavellian than that, but I'll describe it more in my, in my talk tomorrow. And because fishes presumably enjoy the touch of these ministrations from these cleaners, we find extensions of this behavior where fishes like this, uh, this Nassau grouper known to locals as Larry, will swim up to di trusted divers to get caressed. There's no parasite removal service going on here. It's simply uh, a back rub, and uh, they appear to love it. They, they go up there. I, I spoke at a vet school earlier this year. Actually, I don't have that slide. We'll save that for tomorrow. I have more examples of that phenomenon. We may ask, is it really therapeutic? We can ask that question. We can do scientific studies and measure the physiology of these creatures and see how they respond, and lo and behold, we find that it appears to be therapeutic. Monkeys do a lot of grooming. Some species, such as baboons, spend a fifth of their waking time grooming each other. Is it therapeutic? Well, how do you measure that? It used to be to measure the hormone changes in a monkey. You had to dart the animal and then draw blood. Well, that's pretty stressful. That's a pretty big confound. That's going to change the biochemistry of that animal before you even get the blood. Now we can just simply an analyze their poop. So you can just note who defecated, get the, get the feces, analyze that, and a very non-invasive way of uh, getting a read on their, on their hormone changes. Turns out that mother baboons who've lost an infant to uh, predation or disease or what have you, they show a change in glucocorticoids, a stress hormone, for about a month, which is about the same pattern that we see in humans, in, in women who lose an infant. We, don't, we know that it's a terrible, grievous loss. We don't know what kind of emotions that, that baboons are feeling, but the fact that their hormone changes reflect ours suggests that they may be having somewhat related, similar feelings for a similar length of time. turns out that mother baboons who are grieving the loss of an infant spend a lot more time doing this, grooming others and being groomed by others presumably because it's therapeutic, because it's de-stressing. And indeed, their glucocorticoid hormones go down faster for that reason. Uh, their closest associates, family members, relatives in the group also show these changes, although to a lesser degree, because it's not their own infant that they lost. We can see a similar pattern in fishes. 
where surgeon fishes, for instance, given the opportunity to receive strokes, you put them in a tank with a moving model that can stroke their body. These guys are being stressed by the scientists before they're, before they're given this opportunity. They swim up and receive these caresses repeatedly, and their, and their cortisol stress hormone levels go down much quicker than fishes who put in a tank with a, with a model stationary. It's not delivering. They ignore those. They can't get any strokes. They can't get any uh, caresses from that. So that's a, a study that showed the same kind of phenomenon as we saw in the baboons in fishes, who I'm happy to say who were, to, were returned by the scientists to the same area of the Great Barrier Reef that they caught them. That's actually not typical. You don't see that in published scientific studies, and, and now we're seeing that more and more, which is encouraging. Similarly, sharks are stroked by certain divers, caressed into a state of semi spaced outness, I guess you could say. How's that for a scientific bit of jargon? Um, and they get become hyper, hyper relaxed. The jargon actually is tonic immobility. They become almost catatonic where they're just not moving. Presumably they're just hyper relaxed in a very uh, spaced out state. And in that state, sci uh, scientists and do-gooders can remove large fishing hooks from their mouths. There's one account I had recently from a diver. I'll show a slide of this blue shark tomorrow who has a big hook, huge hook in the mouth from a fishing boat that was probably just cut free because they didn't want to deal with the business end of this blue shark. And that shark swimming around for weeks, months, possibly years with a huge hook buried in the mouth, probably not very fun. And so they take bolt cutters down there and they can stroke these sharks into a state of relaxation where they're much more amenable to having these, these uh, hooks removed from their mouths. This particular blue shark swam around the divers for some time thereafter, presumably or possibly showing gratitude for the good deed that was done. There's other ways that animals get pleasure. There's, there's anecdotal evidence for humor and jokes uh, in, in great apes, for instance. And you can watch videos of animals in, in situations where they seem to be, there seems to be almost mirth and humor. A series of studies published in scientific journals by uh, an American neuroscientist named Jacques Panksepp showed that rats love to be tickled on the belly. This is behavior they do to each other when they're young, and they, rats expecting to be tickled will chase the hand to be tickled, and they'll make these, lots of these ultrasonic chirps in the 50 kilohertz range, kilohertz range, which are associated with positive affect. This can all be measured. Scientists like to measure things, and it helps to convince us that there's something really going on there. Uh, I wouldn't do to mention uh, animal pleasure without mentioning sex. Uh, I don't know if there's any young people in the audience, but anyway, hide your eyes if you're, if you're a little bit offended <laughs> by animals engaging in sexual intercourse. Often it's seasonal, but they're very motivated when that season rolls around. Presumably, it's rewarding for them, too. Some animals will invest greatly to try and get sex with the opposite sex. Uh, the elaborate structures on a male peacock, for instance, uh, really the product of choosy females who for generations have been picking males with more impressive tail trains and therefore driving the evolution of these elaborate, uh, costly um, adornments. And another example from the oceans among fishes, they also, many species, engage in courtship. Here's one of the more elaborate examples. A, a small puffer fish about four inches long spends hours or days making these beautiful uh, Mandela-like -like structures about six feet across, perfect circles. They look like a giant reached down and pushed his thumb into the, into the, uh, into the sand or her thumb. And uh, this is uh, a tiny little fish. You can see the fish about there, so that gives you an idea of scale. So. Are we talking aesthetic pleasure here? I mean, I think peahens must have some sense of aesthetic pleasure. They must get some sort of thrill out of an impressive peacock display. And I would say that a female pufferfish of this particular species, which was only described for the first time about two years ago, I'll probably also get a, get a, a kick out of seeing this. Fishes do like bling. Uh, when you give them an opportunity to adorn their nests with, uh, with bits of tin foil, they will take those tin foil and, and adorn their nests with it. So there is, appears to be uh, evidence of artistic appreciation among fishes. A pure coincidence that a vegan cheesecake that I made for a staff holiday party some years ago looked a lot like this. You won't typically find the word love in the index of most biology textbooks, but um, we should expect love, emotions like love, to evolve in species who, for instance, need to work together to raise their young successfully, mothers and fathers, parents, as in giraffes here. Um, and that, those genes for love will be inherited by the offspring, uh, who is more likely to survive thanks to the close cooperation of the parents. So emotions are just as subject to evolution by natural selection as our physical traits. Here we have a couple of uh, rainbow lorikeets, an Australian parrot, kissing each other. And this, this behavior is called billing or kissing. 
and it's a, probably a way of cementing bonds and relationships. They may also exchange food, which is another way of showing I, I really appreciate you being around. Another form of pleasure, I mentioned comfort earlier. Comfort's really important, actually. Again, we think of it as a little bit frivolous, but if you're cold and if you stay cold or you get colder, you're on the way to death if you're a warm-blooded creature. So it's important to stay warm, and it feels nice. Our bodies reward us for doing the right thing. Stepping in a sauna when you've just been out in the, say, Texas sunshine, we won't talk about Portland for sunshine so much, uh, but stepping into a sauna does not feel good if you're really hot, but if you're really chilly, it feels great. So the same stimulus can feel good or bad depending on what your internal needs are and what your internal state is. We're always seeking homeostasis to, to bring ourselves back to a stable state. And uh, ring-tailed lemurs know that. Well, they probably don't know that. They may not know that. They haven't studied the biology textbooks. But it sure feels nice to feel that sun on their bellies in the morning after a cold night. No explanation needed on that slide. Maybe a little explanation here. These are chickens at the sanctuary I volunteered at. You open the barn doors in the morning in the fall when it's a little chilly, and that ray of sun comes in, and they sprawl on their sides and spread their wings in a classic bird sunbathing behavior to maximize their body surface, receiving the uh, sun's rays, the nice warm rays. Something we often don't talk about in terms of the quality of animals' lives is freedom. A, a, a quality that's so important, fundamentally important, so important that animals probably don't think about it, unless, of course, they lose their freedom, in which case it's a terrible, uh, it's a bad thing to happen to them, and we, we recognize that. But we need to be aware that having freedom is a big plus for animals, and they deserve to have that. So bringing it together, then, uh, continuing on the theme of animal pleasure, if an animal can feel good things, not merely be a pain avoider, but be a pleasure seeker, then the animal has intrinsic value. That life is intrinsically valuable. It's valuable beyond any utilitarian value to, to someone else, such as us. The animal has, can feel pleasure, can have joy, can experience emotions, and therefore it's a life worth living, which is, uh, you could say, a quality life of life, life worth living. Uh, an important corollary to that is that death is harmful. If life's worth living, uh, losing life is, is, is you losing opportunities to enjoy. So animals seek to uh, minimize pain, they seek to maximize pleasure, and they seek to avoid death. And sentience is a word we don't hear a lot, but we should hear more uh, of it. It's an important word. It's the capacity to feel. And sentience, I like to say, is the bedrock of ethics, the foundation of moral systems. The reason we have a sense of good and bad is that other individuals can feel things. They can have good days and bad days. They can have good things happen to them or bad things happen to them. And humans tend to be very adept at categorizing. We're good at car we, we compartmentalize. The animal on the left in our culture is generally regarded as a source of food, and the animal on the right as a beloved f a family pet or companion. Even though in some other parts of the world, the animal on the left is regarded as a sacred creature to be protected, and the one on the right can be treated horribly as a source of food. Biologically, they're comparable creatures. They're both mammals. Yes, the one on the left will grow to be much bigger, but they have similar capacities, similar emotional profiles, similar, similar physical needs. And it's time we thought about their needs as something on the, as part of the moral landscape. And because this is a vegetarian, vegan conference, I want to put it in that context that we all have a choice in what we eat. And most of this audience here is probably already thinking about that, the fact that you're here. Uh, but if you are, then you're ambassadors for spreading this message that we need to be including animals in our circle of moral concern. I love what Anne Frank said. That to me, this speaks about the word empowerment. It's really empowering to know that we don't have to wait a single moment before we make a difference in the world because we can make it immediately and every day by the choices we make. It's great if we can influence others to make more um, compassionate choices, but we can at least be completely 100% in control of the choices we make in our society. And so I sometimes encourage audiences to, if you're not... If you're not vegetarian, go vegetarian. If you're, if you're already vegetarian, go vegan. And if you're not sure about it, give it 30 days. 30 days is uh, short enough that it's not that daunting or terrifying, but it's long enough that you may feel the effects and get into a rhythm that you find that you might like to keep, keep doing as you move forward. And there's various benefits. 
I love this. I love this cartoonist uh, Peraro. So I'm I'm showcasing a couple of his cartoons here. Uh, health is certainly part of the benefit. The environment, uh, feeling good, but also doing a good deed to these animals that have these emotions. And uh, as this book by my colleague Michael Greger shows, the best-selling book, which is a sign of the times. Uh, how not to die. It is definitely in your own, own interest to eat uh, lower on the food chain if you're eating high on the food chain. And more and more Americans are thinking about this. Trends over the last decade show that Americans are reducing their meat consumption. Uh, this may be more omnivores choosing vegetarian options because they're more available, uh, or the uptake of more vegetarians is probably a combination of the two, but we're definitely seeing some changes. So um, in closing, we definitely um, need to work towards a better relationship to animals. And I just love the concept of karma, that what's good for them is also good for us. So uh, being animal conscious and animal friendly in our eating habits is not just animal friendly, it's human friendly because it makes for a more compassionate world, uh, which is better for us as well. And if you care to be in touch with me, um, I have Facebook and Twitter accounts and Instagram. And I also do a newsletter once a month uh, on fishes because that's my latest book. So just email me that address at the bottom, and I'll be happy to send you uh, a newsletter once a month. And I think I have time for a few questions. I, sadly, I don't have any books because uh, of a miscommunication. We don't have any books today or tomorrow of my books to sell. Uh, but you can always order them anywhere online you like. There is some literature up here that you can come and get, including an excerpt from the book that appeared in Scientific American. Some bookmarks do help yourself. I don't want to take them home in my suitcase. So uh, I'd be happy to take a few questions if we have time. I believe we do. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, so I noticed in your talk um, you made a lot of references to um, animal studies where we were um, observing animal behavior and, and um, using that to, you know, learn, like, get into the mind of the animal. I'm wondering what is the line between animal experimentation and research that informs us about animals and animal research that is harmful? Because, for example, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the new animal lab that's being built at the University of Washington, and there's there's currently a campaign to go against that. And I'm just wondering what, what your take on that, where's that line, and, and how can we do research and learn about animals without harming It's an important question. Thanks for raising it. And thanks for being thoughtful to speak loudly. You didn't have a mic. I think most people heard the question. Do I need to repeat it for anyone? Basically, the question is, you know, how, how do I feel or what do we do about the, the question of some of the studies that are most revealing about animals in our lives may not be animal friendly. And um, definitely vivisection is something I want to see go out the window. Vivisection, as I would define it, is harming animals, research that harms animals. As I showed from some examples, research can be done that doesn't harm animals. Nevertheless, some of the studies I do cite and I do cite in my books uh, such as the one with the surgeon fishes, which I was happy to say were released back into the Great Barrier Reef. Nevertheless, those fishes were caught, taken from their homes in the wild. It's, that's stressful enough. Then they were put in a bucket of water just enough to cover their bodies for 30 minutes. That's really stressful, which was the way they designed to stress them so that their cortisol levels would go up and then they could see how they responded to being caressed. And then they did the right thing at the end, took them back to the wild. Of course, after you let them go, you know, what's their fate? We don't know. I mean, maybe a, another fish moved into their territory. Definitely disruptive. I disrupted the lives of bats in my, in my doctoral research. I lost sleep over it. I hated it. I didn't kill them, not deliberately. A couple of them died in my, under my watch. So whenever you take, take animals out of the wild and you study them, you're impinging on their lives and having an impact. So we have to grapple with this issue. Scientists are incredibly innovative and creative. We can come up with better ways, and scientists are doing that with these fMRI studies I mentioned, with the dog, clever dog lab studies. You know, dogs, they're becoming the darlings of ethology research. They're, they, they're so great because we can understand them better, and they understand our, our communications better. So it's good to see more dog research being done on happy dogs who are people's companions. So as to studies that are harmful to animals, um, if the study's being done, I don't have any influence on whether it was done or not. I, if I feel like I, by citing the study, I can help to advance the animal's cause so that maybe ultimately fewer of those studies will be done, maybe that's a utilitarian approach. Nevertheless, I will cite those studies. But I do try to present a voice that says, let's not be harming animals in research. Yes.
Yeah, yeah. I mean, just back to your first point, IntelliCentrism is a term I've used uh, for how we tend to be intelligence-focused as, a, as a really a character that determines whether an animal is worthy of our concern or not. How, how convenient for us when we tend to hold ourselves in a very high esteem when it comes to intelligence. I'll give an example tomorrow of a fish who does something we can't do cognitively. Chimpanzees have been shown to do some things we can't do cognitively. Animals are good at what's useful to them, so they have their own kinds of intelligences. And yeah, we ought to, to, to sort of get off that IntelliCentrism track and not be just considering that the only important thing. To me, uh, it's a little bit Bentham-esque, Bentham Jeremy Bentham. It, the question is not can they talk or can they reason, but can they feel or can they suffer, he said. The suffer being more in the realm of sentience, feeling, that's where it's at. That, that's the important criterion, in my view, of moral consideration. If animals can feel, if they can suffer, if they can feel good, then we need to include them in our circle of moral concern and we need to give them due respect. Four years of studying fishes has convinced me that fishes are every bit as deserving as of our moral consideration as we currently grant to other mammals. So um, as to the specifics of your last part of your question, what kind of intelligence do I think is the most, the most telling, perhaps? Um, I don't really have a strong opinion about that. I think we can see that animals... Certain animals, we may argue where to draw the line between sentience and non-sentience, draw it in pencil because new scientific evidence causes us to change our view. But definitely all the vertebrates are clearly sentient. They ought to be all considered uh, given our moral consideration. We need to be taking them into consideration and not just running roughshod over them in their living spaces if, as we've been doing. Uh, right here. Yeah, thanks for raising that. That's an, an important one, too. I have two responses to plant sentience. One is the, sort of the scientific, well, they don't have nervous systems and they can't move away from bad things, so there was never any real evolutionary basis for them needing to feel pain, to aversion to things. Um, there's that new popular book, The Secret Lives of Trees, I think it's called. Uh, I have yet to read it. There's the um, What a Plant Knows, published by my publisher a few years ago. Um, the, 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 the guy who studied, who did that, books makes it clear that it's, he's not arguing that fishes have a, uh, a cognitive life, but they're responsive to changes in their environment and they're very res responsive to, to stimuli. It doesn't mean that they're feeling anything in the way that we des describe feeling as sentience. That's the one kind of answer you can give where it gets a little bit dense and you're sort of arguing science. The moral answer is that let's just say, let's just say plants are sentient. If plants were sentient, then uh, the vegan diet is the best way to live, uh, eating plants directly. Because if you eat animals, you're eating animals who had to eat plants, had to consume plants, far more plants to build their muscle than if you eat plants directly. So the most, the most animal-friendly diet is veganism for sure. The most plant-friendly diet for sure is veganism. So that can skirt the issue. Because often the undercurrent of the question is, you know, well, if plants suffer, you're just eating more plants by being vegan. And so I think it's important to point out that, uh, that veganism, plant-based diets, uh, somewhat paradoxically to, to the sound of it, are, are the most plant-friendly diets. Uh, over there, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I regard... And I think most would agree with me that, that um, consciousness is a prerequisite for sentience. There's some debate about that. I think you have to be able to experience something to feel pain or pleasure. Those are experiences. And so there has to be some kind of conscious awareness, some kind of experience of the world. So I think consciousness is a prerequisite and a requirement of, of sentience. There was a meeting at Cambridge University a few years ago where they, they come up with this declaration of consciousness, which essentially it was quite inclusive, uh, pretty, inc pretty much tacitly, if not, if not explicitly inclusive of all vertebrates. And now there's science on some cephalopod mollusks, octopuses and squids, and some crustaceans that are showing that they appear to also be sentient. So that's why I say draw that line in pencil. Tom Reagan was the one who suggested that, because we, new science uh, makes us question what we assumed before all the time. Yes? Uh, you make an extremely compelling argument. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a philosopher. Uh oh. <laughs> I'm constantly amazed that my otherwise uh, brilliant colleagues can't uh, make this uh, connection. So am I. What's the matter with you guys? Well, <laughs> I was going to ask you about your your, your scientist colleagues. Um, how do you how do you deal with uh, you know uh, colleagues who uh, nod and say that's great research? 
don't. I don't deal with them. I go, go straight to the lay public. My writing and my speaking is mainly to lay audiences. I mean, there's scientists here, I'm sure, but mostly non-scientists. Similarly, my books are written for non-scientists. Scientists, you know, they, they love to navel gaze and, and get into, to, as philosophers do too, which is fine. It's great. It's important we have philosophy and it's important we have science, but we also need to look at the bigger picture and, and make some big decisions about how we ought to be. And uh, I, I like the principle of giving the benefit of the doubt. You know, the party who's got the most to lose, the one who's going to be most injured if we if we if we err and we're wrong, uh, let's give them the doubt, the benefit of that doubt. So, but thanks for mentioning that. I, I think it's important. It is important to engage scientists and philosophers in this and to listen to what they're saying, but also encourage lay people to make important decisions, regardless of what philosophers are saying, because most of them aren't saying the right thing yet. I think. All right, sir, back there. Do we have another question? Uh, do we have time for maybe one more? Couple more, okay, at the very back, yes. Yeah, I don't know of any such studies. The, the question boils down to quality of life, I think. Which is the better quality of life? And having lived with mostly cats, you know, it's a, it's a challenging one. I mean, there's so many costs and benefits either way. Um, the Humane Society Institute for Science and Policy, for which I worked before I joined them, had a conference on indoor versus outdoor cats, which is a big debate some years ago. I haven't read all the proceedings of that conference. They are available online on an animal studies repository that we do. So if you t type in animal studies repository, it'll take you to there, and you can check that out. It's a great resource for finding uh, stuff that's otherwise not easily available online. But, um, you know, for it, just the things that come to my mind, you know, indoor cat, we just, we just adopted it. Well, we just got a feral off the streets. We were seeing this feral for weeks, this poor little scrawny little cat who was, you know, scrounging and not, probably not a great quality of life for that particular cat, even though in a very affluent area of southern Florida. Not easy to be out there in the wild. A lot of, a lot of a hazards to life. This cat has seemed to really embrace, from about 24 hours after we trapped the cat and brought the cat into the house, the cat, of course, was terrified of us at first, but has seems to have since embraced the uh, relatively uh, domestic uh, life where you're fed on a schedule. Um, you get warm surfaces and soft pillows to sleep on. You have the company of, a, of, a, of an adoring 14-year-old female. So a pretty good life. Um, uh, but, you know, th then again, some cats I've seen seem to be really bored and really uh, not happy being inside. Uh, in, Brit in Britain, the tradition is, you know, horror, the idea we keep cats indoors. But the flip side is these cats are outside catching li not millions, not even hundreds of millions, but billions of birds, at least in North America. So there's huge ecological implications. It's a big, big debate, big fuss. And now there's the new book about cats in the wild and whether we're recommending that they should be killed under it by any means necessary is the, is the notorious quote uh, that the authors have recommended. That book's getting a lot of attention, not all positive, it's a very controversial issue. Yes. The question is, do I think that cats and dogs, for instance, take on uh, more compassionate attitudes the longer they live with us? Uh, in most cases, I would say not, because I don't think we're always we're usually setting a very compassionate example. I think the people in this room perhaps may be working at a higher level of compassion uh, because you're at a conference like this. Um, but in, by and large, I kind of, a lot of the time, hope they don't follow our example. Um, animals do what they need to do. They, they don't, I think, you know, to use the psychological, ter uh, sorry, the philosophical terminology, uh, we think of ourselves as moral agents where we can make moral decisions and we can reflect on right and wrong. There is some emerging evidence that some animals may be able to do that too. But by and large, we do not think the lion is wrong for killing to eat. That's a lion's way, and a lion maybe doesn't have any choice in that. We're the ones that have the choice vis-a-vis -vis the uh, pig in the uh, cafe. So um, whether or not animals can pick up being more moral because of us, interesting question. I don't know if there's been much study of that. Maybe one more? Do we have time for one more? We're right at the time. I think we'll have to cut it there. Please come and get some literature. Thanks again for coming today.